Welcome, everybody. So I'm very excited to be joined by a spectacular attorney here, attorney Frederick Voigtman. Fred's been an attorney for, I think, over 25 years now. Fred, you can correct me if I'm wrong. And he does all aspects of family immigration and business immigration. And among the various areas that he practices in, one that he really focuses on is EB-5. In today's video, I want to really focus on the EB-5 visa and I want to get Fred's insights on you know, various aspects of the program, some general information and some other more thoughtful analysis that you might not be hearing in other places. So I think that you're going to find this video illuminating and I'm excited to get this started. With that, welcome, Fred. Thank you so much for joining. Very excited to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Michael. I'm Always excited to talk about EB-5. Awesome. So general overview, big picture, EB-5 is an immigration option that can allow somebody to get a green card in the U.S. based on making an investment in a U.S. business and creating jobs for U.S. workers. And through this program, the individual, the investor, can qualify for a green card for themselves, their spouse, and their unmarried children under 21 years old. So with that, Fred, I want to ask you, can you provide us with kind of a basic overview of the EB-5 program? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So the program was established in 1990 by Congress, and it was designed to sort of spur the U.S. economy to encourage foreign investment and job creation and economic growth. But for the first couple of years, the program really didn't take off the way that it was intended. And there's speculation as to why that happened, but Congress decided to sweeten the pot a little bit. And in 1992, they established what's called the Regional Center EB-5 program. And so this allows for indirect job creation as opposed to direct jobs. Under the direct EB-5 program, the investor must make the qualifying investment and create jobs for 10 U.S. workers. And those jobs have to be W-2. They have to be working for this new commercial enterprise that is established by the investor. So the regional center program, the beauty of that is it allows for indirect and induced jobs to be counted towards meeting that 10 job requirement. And so that's something that Congress did in 1992 to make the EB-5 program a little more attractive and a little bit easier to receive foreign investment. So the regional centers, these are just entities that are set up, they're US companies that are set up, and then they apply in turn to USCIS for designation so that they can actually go out and raise EB-5 capital and they're authorized to do that by the USCIS. Awesome. Thank you for that overview. And so now we have direct investments, which is basically any non-regional center EB-5 investment, and you have regional center investments, and both are in effect at this time. There's been instances where the regional center program was paused, but now we're, we're in a situation where both direct investments and regional center investments are being accepted by USCIS. And we'll get more into that, the distinctions between those options in a bit here. But thank you for that overview. So now that we have that kind of general big picture of EB-5, why don't we go through some of the requirements to qualify for an EB-5 visa? Fred, if you'd like to share some of those with us. Sure. So the EB-5 program, it's an investment program, but it's also a job creation program. And as with any of these different immigration programs, it's form driven. So one of the first requirements is to file the appropriate petition form with USCIS in the United States. So regardless of where the investor is, whether in the US or in his or her home country, there is a centralized filing location in Washington, DC. It's called the Immigrant Investor Program Office. And that's the group that adjudicates these petitions. The petition form is called I-526 for a direct EB-5 investor and I-526E for a regional center investor. So the requirements would be you have to invest in something, right? You're going to invest in what's called an NCE. That stands for New Commercial Enterprise. So that's a U.S. entity that has been formed after November 29th of 1990. You can make investments in NCEs that were formed prior to that date, but you must restructure or reorganize those entities or expand the entity to more than 40% of its net worth. You have to invest the money into the entity. Minimum investment amounts are 800000 
or 1.05 million, depending on the location of where the NCE is principally doing business. What happens to your investment? You can't just put money into the bank account and have it sit there. It has to be working. It has to be creating jobs. It has to be what they call at risk in the new commercial enterprise. And it has to be sustained at risk for two years. We're going to talk about that a little bit later because there's a new rule that has come out with regard to how long the investment must be maintained. So there's your investment into a new commercial enterprise. The investment, there has to be a nexus or a connection between the investment and job creation. The jobs that are created in a direct EB-5 must be full-time, which is defined as 35 hours per week. They must be direct employees, not independent contractors of the new commercial enterprise. Who's a qualifying employee? A U.S. worker would be a U.S. citizen, a permanent resident, someone who has work authorization, say, through the asylee program, but it does not include the investor, the investor's spouse, or sons or daughters or anybody else who's not authorized to work or is here just as a non-immigrant. So those are the steps where you have to file the initial petition. You get your petition approved and you can either adjust status in the United States or apply for an immigrant visa at a U.S. consular post, usually in the investor's home country. Two years later, you file the petition to remove the condition because the initial approval is only valid for two years. USCIS wants to see that you've really sustained your investment and you truly created the jobs before they give you the permanent 10-year green card. Thank you for that detailed analysis. And later on in a bit, we'll discuss the process of obtaining an EB-5 visa because I think one of the aspects of the EB-5 program, and I think one of the misconceptions about the EB-5 program that chills a lot of interest is that some people think they have to create 10 jobs immediately. And that can be an overwhelming thought, especially if it's a new business or what have you. But in reality, you don't have to create all 10 jobs immediately. You have quite a bit of time to do that. And of course, we'll, we'll discuss that as we kind of go through the process of obtaining an EB-5 visa and what the whole process looks like. Because as Fred mentioned, the EB-5 program, as part of the initial part of the process, an investor will obtain a conditional green card. And then later on, they will apply to remove the condition from their green card to become an unconditional lawful permanent resident. And so there's various things that need to take place at each step of the process. And we'll cover that in a bit. So Fred, you mentioned that there's two ways to go about the EB-5 process. Somebody can make a direct investment or a regional center investment. Can you share some insight into what's the more popular option between the two? Who is more well-suited for one option versus the other? Just some insights into what you see as the differences, the advantages of one option over another option, and however you'd like to share some insight into the differences between the two. Sure. Yeah, that's really important, right? Because they're very different aspects of the EB-5 program. The regional center program is by far the most popular, representing up to 90% of all EB-5 cases are in fact regional center cases. And there's reasons for that because those regional center projects typically, and now it's required, that the direct EB-5 program is only a single investor. It used to be you could actually pool investors' capital in a direct program, but that's been changed. So the regional center investment projects tend to be real estate development, construction projects of a large scale. And EB-5 Capital is either a mezzanine piece or an additional piece of the financing to build out this large construction project. So it's not uncommon to see 50, 100, 150, or even more EB-5 investors in a particular regional center project. I think the more entrepreneurial you are, if you're a businessman and you're planning on already investing in the United States, you have business experience and you, you really think that you can make your investment and your business thrive in the United States, that might be a situation where the investor would think about a direct EB-5 investment. It's not something where you're just going to do a direct EB-5 investment just for the green card. It's that you have a good business model, a good idea because you're responsible for running that business over the next few years. And if you fail, you're not going to be able to either obtain your two-year conditional green card, or if your business fails after that, you won't be able to remove the condition. So there is some aspect of riskier in the direct EB-5 program than the regional center program. There's certainly risk in both programs, but most of the regional centers that are thriving now have an established track record of delivering on completed projects, 
providing things like construction guarantees, petition approval guarantees, and even return of capital. You get into a little bit of difficulty. It's not a loan. It must actually be an at-risk investment. Got it. So by the way, just to kind of add on to what you said and to, to kind of embellish a bit on, on what you said, basically the way that I think of the difference is in some ways, one of the factors, as you mentioned, is for a direct investment, typically the profile of somebody that's going to pursue a direct investment, as you mentioned, is more of an entrepreneurial type of person that wants to take on that role of operating a business in the US. Whereas the regional center process is more so tailored to somebody that wants to delegate those responsibilities of operating a business to somebody else or a different group of people that will take that and kind of take care of that responsibility for them. A couple of questions that I have in light of what you said, you mentioned that some of these projects are offering guarantees of the return of the capital. Does that in any way impact the at-risk component of the EB-5 program? If the capital is guaranteed to be returned to the investor, does that disrupt the requirement that the funds be put at risk? Yes, it does. And I misspoke a little bit. So I'm glad you asked about that. So the guarantees in some of these regional center projects are that the loan from the job creating entity will be repaid to the new commercial enterprise. We didn't talk about that so much yet, but some of these regional center projects are set up where a single purpose entity like a limited partnership or an LLC is established for the purpose of receiving the EB-5 capital. But the business of that NCE is to loan money to the developer, right? To the job creating entity. So the guarantee of repayment of the capital is that loan repayment guarantee. It's not a guarantee that the investors will receive their capital back from the new commercial enterprise. Let's move on. So earlier, we briefly just glistened upon this aspect of targeted employment area. And so the investment amount for EB-5 is not one amount. There's two amounts, and Federal kind of emphasizes again, and we kind of go over this aspect, but targeted employment areas are special areas that qualify for a reduced investment amount. And so if your business is located within a targeted employment area or principally does business within a targeted employment area, you can potentially qualify as an EB-5 investor to invest a reduced amount. So again, we'll have Fred, if you want to kind of share what a targeted employment area is, what the investment amount is, if one is investing in a targeted employment area versus a non a standard area, if you will. And there's this interesting language of in order to qualify for an investment being made in a targeted employment area, your business has to be principally doing business within that area. So what does that mean? How do you know if your business is principally doing business within a targeted employment area? What if your business has multiple locations? And one location is doing business in a targeted employment area and another location is outside of a targeted employment area. What happens then? If you can share some insights, I know this is a packed question, but if you can share some insights on how do you know if your area is located within a targeted employment area? And so I'll let you run with that. That's a great question. It's going to be a bit of a gray area. USCIS does have some language in the policy manual that gives some guidance about what it considers are some factors in determining if the new commercial enterprise is in fact principally doing business in a targeted employment area. Before we get to that, let's just define really quickly. A TEA, targeted employment area, is either a rural area, and rural has a very specific, very straightforward definition. It is any area that is outside of a metropolitan statistical area, an MSA, and has less than 20,000 population. So you can go to the Census Bureau. They have the listings of the MSA. So you can determine if your location is within or outside of an MSA. And then you can also look at the census data for the latest population numbers. So if it's less than 20,000 and it's outside of an MSA, congratulations, you're in a rural area, a rural TEA. And that's going to be really important later when we talk about set-asides. The other way to be in a TEA is by unemployment rate. So if a particular census tract or a group of census tracts that are touching one another. You can average those unemployment rates. And if it's 50% higher than the national average, then you're in a high unemployment TEA. So that's the definition of what a TEA is. How do you know if you're principally doing business in a TEA? There's the easy answer, which is where are your employees located? But more and more, the economy and just the way the world is now, we have remote employees, right? They're not all in one centralized location. So where are the records, the official documents? Where is the inventory or equipment? 
Where has the investment that is most closely related to job creation, where has that been focused? And really, other than that, USCIS has given us some bullet points where the jobs are created, where the investment that created the jobs is mainly focused, where the equipment and inventory is located. But really, at the end of the day, when you're filing an I-526 petition, you, as the petitioner, have the burden to establish that you meet all of these eligibility grounds. So if you want to really take advantage of this TEA, it would behoove you, it would make your case easier if you can make USCIS's adjudication easier and give them some evidence to bolster your claim that you're principally doing business in a TEA. In the example you gave, Michael, what if you have three or four different locations, small businesses or small shops, and your employment creation is spread out between those three or four locations, Some of them are in TEAs and some of them are not. You're going to have an uphill battle, but I think there's a way to establish, hey, this is our headquarters. This is our main location. When we have meetings, all the employees come to this location. All of the accounting and bookkeeping is stored at this location. You start to get in line with what USCIS would consider principally doing business. Great answer. Thorough. Much appreciated. And again, just to reiterate, you don't have to necessarily file your application as an investment that's being made in a targeted employment area. It's just that if you do invest within a targeted employment area, you can take advantage of a lower investment amount. Right now, as of the time that this video is being recorded, if you make an investment in a targeted employment area and you qualify for that targeted employment area investment amount, that amount is $800,000. And if your investment is not within a targeted employment area, then the standard investment amount is $1,050,000. We'll move on. And now we're going to go into the process of getting an EB-5 visa. It's not, let me put some papers together and send it. And now I got my green card. It's a much more involved, multi-part process. And at each step in the process, different things need to be done. Different things need to be demonstrated to USCIS. And so with that, I'll leave the floor to you, Fred, to just kind of walk us through what the process is like, what an investor can expect when they're entering into this process. And we'll go from there. Yeah. I think the first step is really the most important one, because as an investor, you really need to do some due diligence. You have to do your own due diligence if you're going to do a direct EB-5 investment as well. If you have business partners or you need to research and study the market where you're going to be setting up your business, you need to be aware of potential pitfalls and strengths and weaknesses and things of that nature as you think about your business model and your business plan. But this type of due diligence that I'm referring to is really for those who are looking to invest in a regional center. So there are I think the latest count is 600 designated regional centers. That number may be coming down because of some of the compliance requirements in the new RIA, Restore Integrity Act from last March, that may result in a number of regional centers becoming decertified. But there are regional centers and there are different projects within a given regional center. You may have one regional center that has two or three projects going on at the same time. So as an investor, you want to do the research, do the due diligence, whether on your own or whether by hiring a due diligence expert. There are service providers that offer that type of service for a fee, and they will do some of the background research. You need to choose your investment. If it's a direct investment, you probably already know what you're going to do. If it's a regional center, you need to choose the regional center and then choose a regional center project. You really should hire an immigration attorney. Because the regional center is not going to do the work for you that is necessary to vet and to prove your lawful source and path of funds. It's a very big requirement of the EB-5 program because the U.S. government does not want to have laundered illegal money coming into the United States. So there is a requirement to establish that the funds were obtained through lawful means. And that's where your immigration attorney can help you to document that aspect of the EB-5 case. You're going to work with your attorney to prepare and file the I-526E and send that to USCIS. The regional center has its own template that it's going to provide, and the EB-5 immigration attorney fills in the lawful source of funds and documents that part. If you're in the United States, there's a great opportunity. It's called concurrent filing. And if you're here in valid status, like an H-1B, for example, or even an F-1, or even potentially a visitor visa, although there's some problems schematically with that, But if you're in the United States in valid non-immigrant status, you can file concurrently for adjustment of status on your I-485 
your I-765, which is employment authorization, and your I-131, which is advanced parole travel document. If you're not in the United States, you'll be doing what's called immigrant visa processing. So you must wait for the approval of the I-526 petition, and then you'll go through the rest of the immigrant visa processing. At the end of that processing, you'll receive a conditional green card. As we mentioned earlier, it's valid for two years. During the last 90 days of that two-year period, you must file the I-829 petition to remove the condition. If that petition is ultimately approved, you'll receive a 10-year green card. And if you meet all the other requirements five years after receiving your conditional green card, you can apply for naturalization to become a U.S. citizen. Okay, so a couple points that I want to emphasize and I would like to have you answer. One is, at what point do the funds need to be invested? That's a question that people are always curious about. So at what point in this process does the money need to be invested? And at what point do the jobs need to be created? Because those are two critical requirements for this program. When do they need to each take place respectively? Right. Yeah. Very important. So the EB-5 law requires that the full amount of the capital that the investor has invested or is in the process of investing. So we can talk a little bit about what in the process of investing means. But in general, you're going to be filing an EB-5 petition after you've made the investment or during the process of your investment. So let's say you're filing in a TEA area and your initial investment is $100,000 and you be in the process of investing $700,000 and you make that showing that that's what your plan is in the initial filing. That's fine, but you really should complete that investment before USCIS adjudicates your I-526 petition. There are some circumstances in which you could file within a year after that, but in general, You're going to be investing your EB-5 capital before the I-526 petition is adjudicated. USCIS is going to open your petition maybe in a few months or maybe in a year, and they're going to see that you've filed your petition with proof of a $100,000 investment. So they're going to issue something called a request for evidence to prove that you're in the process of investing and that you're also going to have to demonstrate the lawful source of funds of that investment. The petition must be approvable when it's filed. You cannot make material changes to make a petition that's deficient in a way approvable after the filing date. So that's really important that you have been invested or in the process of investing at the time the petition was filed. As far as job creation, you get a little bit more leeway. The jobs must be created during the two-year conditional period of residence. We know that that's not going to start until after your 526 petition is approved, after you've received your conditional green card. That's the job creation window, if you will, the two years of conditional residence. You must create the jobs within that two-year period or within a reasonable period of time thereafter. What's a reasonable period of time? You better show a good reason why you weren't able to create the jobs within the two-year period, and that it is likely you'll be able to create them within an additional year. Okay, so I want to kind of now move to some questions that I'm sure people are curious about. And that is, for one, what are some reasons why EB-5 cases might get denied? Sure. Thankfully, from personal experience, I don't have too many of those just because of all the preparation that we do in advance and making sure that We know what it's going to take to get the petition approved, but sometimes intervening factors happen. Obviously, if the business fails, closes while your 526 petition is pending, USCIS will eventually find out about that, and that would be a reason for the petition to be denied. We do see denials sometimes from new clients coming in with a petition that's already been denied, and sometimes you see lawful source of funds issues where the investor was not able to document how he or she lawfully obtained the capital or how the capital was transferred from the investor to the new commercial enterprise. That can be grounds for denial of the petition. If the business plan itself does not meet very specific requirements that are listed in a case called Matter of Ho, a non-compliant business plan could also be a reason for an I-526 denial. Okay, so you touched upon source of funds as being one of those kind of common grounds. What are some common sources of funds that people use to fund their EB-5 investments? I know there's a host of kind of these different sources, whether it be from employment earnings, selling a property, the list goes on. But if you could shed some light on what you see as some of the common sources of funds that EB-5 investors will use. I think sale of property or getting a loan against a property 
Those are very common business earnings over a period of many years. That's also common, but it also presents some unique challenges if the investment funds were accumulated and maintained over a period of, say, 10 years or more, that's a lot of documentation because USCIS will want to see that the funds were actually maintained during that period. So gifts, like if you're going to get a gift from a relative, that's perfectly acceptable. But the donor of that gift then has the obligation to provide evidence of where their lawful source of funds came from to give the gift in the first place. So if you sell a property, you're going to need to show how you lawfully earned the funds to buy that property in the first place as well. Awesome. So another thing that I wanted to kind of get your take on is over the last few years alone, we've seen so much development and change within the EB-5 program in terms of investment amounts and starting at one place, going to another place, changing again, and so on. So much fluctuation in the program. And even Recently, USCIS has come out with basically an update of some kind explaining certain components of the EB-5 program relating to how long the funds need to be invested. So more specifically, I'd like to hear about this update from USCIS, if we can get your take on it. And also, where do you see EB-5 going moving forward? Do you anticipate any upcoming changes to the program? Do you think that the requirements that we have in place right now are pretty stable and will move forward as is for the foreseeable future? Do you anticipate any upcoming changes to the program? So if you could answer that. Sure. Yeah, really, really important. You're absolutely right. The EB-5 program has gone through a lot of revisions and trying to reinvent what EB-5 is. That, to some extent, that lack of certainty hurts the market right? Because investors, high net worth individuals want to have certainty about what the requirements are. And if there's a moving target and we don't know when things are going to be changed and if they're going to be applied retroactively, that really puts a strain on the ability of developers to market their programs to EB-5 investors if the requirements are continuously changing. So a great event sort of happened in March of 2022 where we had the Restore Integrity Act, and that's in the United States, laws are passed by Congress, and then they are implemented by the executive agencies, the administrative agencies that are tasked with interpreting and implementing what the will of Congress is. So even though the law was passed in March of last year, USCIS has slowly been rolling out some of its interpretations of what the requirements are in the new law. One of the big changes was that the law removed the requirement that the investment must be sustained for the two-year conditional residency period. So that's actually removed from the EB-5 law. So then the question is, well, how long does the investment have to be sustained? Last month, a USCIS came out with some new guidance that it interprets the investment must be sustained for two years from the time of investment, which is a big difference from two years of conditional residency just because of the lengthy processing times of USCIS and also because some people are waiting in perpetually long visa quota lines. Their two years of conditional residency may not start until five, six, seven, eight or longer years of waiting. So to have this clarity now and statement from USCIS that the investment need only be sustained for two years is really important and it's really helpful. What happens if you make your investment two years ago and you're just filing your I-526 petition now? USCIS says, no, no, you have to keep the investment there at least until you file the I-526 petition. There also still must be a connection between the investment of capital and the creation of jobs. So you can't create the jobs first and then invest the capital. It has to be a cause and effect sort of order to that. Awesome. So just based on what we've talked about today, and then I want to revisit where you anticipate EB-5 going in the future, but just what we've covered today, in recent times, we've seen some major positive developments to EB-5, one being this aspect of concurrent filings, which didn't used to be the case. Before concurrent filings were introduced for EB-5, someone would have to first file an I-526 petition. The I-526 petition would have to be approved and a visa number would have to be available for that person to proceed to the next step, which is to either adjust status in the United States or do their immigrant visa processing abroad. But in recent times, this concept of concurrent filing has been introduced, which has been a tremendous benefit for many people that are lawfully present in the United States that have a visa number available to them because they can concurrently file their I-526 and their adjustment of status, of course, at the same time, concurrently. That's been a huge win. Another huge win is this update 
and this clarification that USCIS provided last month. Again, there's caveats, and you've mentioned some of those in this video, but an investor now is getting guidance from USCIS that the investment needs to be sustained for a period of two years, as opposed to historically just keeping it invested for as long as possible, basically. This two years of sustained investment is also a major win. Where do you see EB-5 going moving forward? Do you think that these various changes that have taken place to the program have now led to a period of stability with the program where we can anticipate that the requirements will remain as is for the foreseeable future? Or do you anticipate any other upcoming changes? I think the stability is key. I think we are establishing some stability in the EB-5 program. I don't anticipate new legislation coming out on EB-5 anytime soon. It still remains to be seen how the agency is going to interpret some of these provisions of the RIA. We know that the regional centers are extended through 2025. So that's just kind of a date. It seems like it's way off in the future, but it's actually not that far away. So we're keeping an eye on that. We don't believe that there will be a pause in the program. The stability and certainty is really what is needed in the EB-5 market for it really to thrive and keep going. Awesome. And then and lastly, just to finish off, anything else that you'd like our audience to know about the EB-5 program? Any other kind of insights that you'd like to share or anything else we didn't cover that you'd particularly like to focus on or draw some attention to? So, I mean, EB-5 is a very special program. It's not for everyone. I always counsel my clients to look for all possible immigration solutions to their goals, to their objectives. But for a lot of people, EB-5 is the only option that they have. It's not the last resort. It's the only option. And for high net worth individuals who see an opportunity for themselves and their families in the American economy, in our educational system, just in our way of life and the freedoms that we enjoy here, it's a very powerful tool for people to be able to obtain permanent residence for themselves and their family members. It's really important to do the due diligence at the beginning, hire an experienced immigration attorney. I would not recommend doing this on your own or having an unexperienced person represent you in this. It's a lot of money and it's a long road to be able to come out the other side with your goal of having permanent residence. Thank you so much. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. Hope you learned a lot from this discussion. If you have any questions that we didn't discuss and we didn't cover in this video, drop them in the comments below. Would love to have you back, Fred, for maybe a potentially a part two or to discuss some other concepts and ideas with you. So everybody that's watching, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the comments. And again, thank you so much, Fred, for joining us. It was a pleasure having you. And like I said, would love to have you back. And thank you to all our viewers. And of course, we'll see you on the next video. Thank you.